Good day everyone. Today, we are going to start with the major part of UGC net exam. That is, British literature. We are going to start dealing with Geoffrey Chaucer. In this video, I will be giving the outline about all his works. In the upcoming videos, I will be dealing with the important works in detail. Watch the video fully to understand all the essential informations about the author, as well as his works. Let's get started. Geoffrey Chaucer was born approximately around 1340s and died in 1400. He is an English poet. He is known as the father of English literature. He was the first writer, buried in Poets' Corner of Westminster Abbey. He is best known for the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer's career can be divided into three phases. First phase is the French period. Second is the Italian period. His last phase is the English period. Now, let's see about those three phases. French period. It lasted until 1372. According to the Norton Anthology of English Literature. During this time, Chaucer translated the Roman de la Rose, a French poem written during the 1200s as Romance of the Rose. It was also in the French period, he also wrote his Book of the Duchess, an elegiac poem, that shared much with contemporary French poetry of the time, but also departed from that poetry in important ways. Chaucer's extensive reading of Latin poets, such as Boethius also influenced his own work. Next, we are going to see about the Italian period. A journey to Italy in 1372 kicked off the Italian period, which lasted from 1372 to 1385. The trip introduced him to the works of contemporary Italian writers, such as Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. At the end of this period, Chaucer wrote his longest poem, Troilus and Chrysida, a love poem that he adapted from Boccaccio's Il Filostrato. His last phase is the English period during the final period of Chaucer's literary career, sometimes referred to as the English period, 1385-1400. Chaucer wrote the work for which he is now best known, The Canterbury Tales. In this classic of English literature, Chaucer tells the stories of a group of disparate travelers on a journey. Often sharp and funny, The Canterbury Tales was more innovative and less formulaic than other contemporary English poetry, such as the work of John Gower. There's a possibility of getting questions in net exam about these three phases. Like, during which phase, did Chaucer wrote the Book of Duchess? So focus a bit on it. Let's move to his works in particular. The Book of the Duchess. It is also known as the Death of Blanche. It is assumed to be written after September 12, 1368, when Blanche of Lancaster died. Some evidence suggests that Chaucer wrote the poem in the memory of the death of Blanche of Lancaster, wife of John of Gaunt, who was Chaucer's patron. Some evidences also reveal some handwritten notes of John Stowe, indicating that the poem was written at John of Gaunt's request. 
It belongs to the dream vision genre. It's an elegy for the death of Blanche. We can expect questions in net exam like, who is the patron of Chaucer? Or whose handwritten notes reveals that the poem was written at John of Gaunt's request. Here's another work, Anilida and Arsite. It's a 357-line English poem. It tells the story of Anilida, queen of Armenia and her wooing by false Arsite from Thebes, Greece. It has a complex structure, with an invocation and then the main story. The story is made up of an introduction and a complaint by Anilida which is in turn made up of a proem, a strophe, antistrophe, and a conclusion. A preface or proem is an introduction to a book or other literary work written by the work's author. An introductory essay written by a different person is a foreword and precedes an author's preface. The preface often closes with acknowledgments of those who assisted in the literary work. A strophe is a poetic term originally referring to the first part of the ode in ancient Greek tragedy, followed by the antistrophe and epode. Antistrophe is the portion of an ode sung by the chorus, in response to the strophe. Epode is a form of lyric poem written in couplets, in which a long line is followed by a shorter one. The poem, Anilida and Arsite ends abruptly, and may be unfinished. The date of the poem's composition is not known but it is often placed in the late 1370s. Next, we are going to see about the House of Fame. It's a Middle English poem. It's probably written between 1374 and 1385, making it one of his earlier works. It is over 2,005 lines long in three books, and takes the form of a dream vision. It was composed in octosyllabic couplets. The story goes like, upon falling asleep, the poet finds himself in a glass temple, adorned with images of the famous and their deeds. With an eagle as a guide, he meditates on the nature of fame and the trustworthiness of recorded renown. This allows Chaucer to contemplate the role of the poet, in reporting the lives of the famous and how much truth there is in what can be told. His another work is, Parliament of Fowls. It's also called the Parliament of Birds or the Assemble of Fowls. It has approximately 700 lines. The poem is in the form of a dream vision in rhyme royal stanza, and contains one of the earliest references to the idea, that St. Valentine's Day is a special day for lovers. Another work is, The Legend of Good Women. It's in the form of a dream vision. It's the third longest of Chaucer's works, after the Canterbury Tales and Troilus and Creseed. It was also unfinished. The prologue describes how Chaucer is reprimanded by the god of love and his queen, Alcest for his works such as Troilus and Creseed depicting women in a poor light. Creseed is made to seem inconstant in love in that earlier work, and Alsus demands a poem of Chaucer, extolling the virtues of women and their good deeds. In the prologue several women are mentioned Esther, Penelope, Marcia, Lavinia, Polyxena and Laodamia whose stories are not recorded. Tennyson used the poem as theme for his own poem, A Dream of Fair Women. The most clear depiction of the importance of women to this piece would be the ten female characters, 
Cleopatra, Thisbe, Dido, Hypsipyle, Medea, Lucaris, Ariadne, Philomela, Phyllis, and Hypermnestra. All of these female characters are taken from classical legends and mythology, which Chaucer decides to retell in his own poem. From this poem, we can expect questions like, who among the following woman character is not recorded or recorded in the poem? Next work is, Troilus and Creseid. It retells the tragic story of the lovers Troilus and Creseid, set against a backdrop of war during the Siege of Troy. It was composed using Rhyme Royal, and probably completed during the mid-1380s. Many Chaucer scholars regard it as the poet's finest work. As a finished long poem, it is more self-contained than the better-known, but ultimately unfinished work, The Canterbury Tales. This poem is often considered the source of the phrase, all good things must come to an end. His next work is, A Treatise on the Astrolabe. It's a medieval instruction manual, on the astrolabe. It describes both the form and the proper use of the instrument, and stands out as a prose technical work, from a writer better known for poetry. The treatise is considered the oldest work in English written upon an elaborate scientific instrument. It is admired for its clarity in explaining difficult concepts although modern readers lacking an actual astrolabe may find the details of the astrolabe difficult to understand. Exact source is undetermined but most of his conclusions go back to Compositio et Operatio Astrolabii, a Latin translation of Mesahala's Arabic treatise, of the 8th century. Chaucer also translated, Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy, and The Romance of the Rose by Guillaume de Loris. Now, we are going to see about the most notable work of Chaucer. Yes. It's the Canterbury Tales. It's a collection of 24 stories that runs to over 17,000 lines. It was written between 1387 and 1400. The tales are presented, as part of a storytelling contest, by a group of pilgrims as they travel together, from London to Canterbury, to visit the shrine of St. Thomas Becket at Canterbury Cathedral. The prize for this contest is a free meal at the Tabard Inn at Southwark on their return. It's considered as his masterpiece. He uses the tales and descriptions of its characters to paint an ironic and critical portrait of English society at the time, and particularly of the church. Chaucer's use of such a wide range of classes and types of people was without precedent in English. Although the characters are fictional, they still offer a variety of insights into customs and practices of the time. Often, such insight leads to a variety of discussions and disagreements among people in the 14th century. For example, Although various social classes are represented in these stories, and all of the pilgrims are on a spiritual quest, it is apparent that they are more concerned with worldly things than spiritual. Structurally, the collection resembles Boccaccio's Decameron, which Chaucer may have read during his first diplomatic mission to Italy in 1372. In the general prologue, 30 pilgrims are introduced. According to the prologue, 
Chaucer's intention was to write four stories from the perspective of each pilgrim, two each on the way to and from their ultimate destination, St. Thomas Becket's Shrine, making for a total of about 120 stories. But, he could able to write only 24 tales. Although perhaps incomplete, the Canterbury Tales, is revered as one of the most important works in English literature. It is also open to a wide range of interpretations. Now, getting into the examination point of view, we can definitely expect at least one question from Canterbury Tales. And another one question from rest of his works. So focus more on the Canterbury Tales. That's it for today. Hope the content was useful. If so, remember to like, share, as well as subscribe to my channel. In the next video, I will be covering the important works of Chaucer in detail. Stay tuned. Meet you all in my next video. Till then, keep learning and growing. Let's grow together. Thank you.